I'm Greg Peterson, uh, co-founder of the Robert Jackson Center, and I'm delighted to welcome everybody to the 2019 Fall Continuing Legal Education Seminar. And um, I think it's for those who are relatively new to it, if you haven't signed up, please do so at some point. Get this voluminous book, which has a variety of things on our topics dealing with solar and distributed energy, opportunities and challenges, also dealing with 40 years of family court, a retrospective, and selective topics in sports law and update. I'll call up Tori Ergang, who will introduce our first session. Tori? Good morning. So I would be remiss if I didn't have us thank the gentleman that makes all of this possible, and I know that you join me in appreciating what Greg does. So thank you very much, Greg. And I believe in the room right now are 50% of the Jackson Center staff. Uh, so we have Marion Beckering, who probably most of us know, Nicole Gustafson, and then I think down by the front door, Sherry Shutter, and the, the new president, uh, Kristen McMahon, who's uh, traveling and not able to be here today. And we are grateful to them for the use of this space. So as I look at the folks who filed in, I try to think, well, that's an interesting person to come to this talk. And what's great about these CLEs is that they really are community driven. And while they're great for attorneys and they're great for your continuing education credits, they do help uh, raise the bar for a lot of us who are outside of the legal profession. So thank you for that. On the panel with us this morning, we have uh, Kevin Blake, who is an associate with Phillips Lytle. <laughs> Mr. Blake focuses his practice on energy law, including advising clients on business development issues and the regulation of electricity, natural gas, and telecommunications before state and federal authorities. Welcome, Kevin. We also have Dennis Elsenbeck, who is the uh, single panelist who is not an attorney. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad, so I, I'll reserve judgment. But he is the head of Energy and Sustainability Energy Consulting Services at Phillips Lytle. Mr. Elsenbeck provides consulting services on a broad range of energy-related opportunities, encompassing a forward view of supply, distribution, and demand options. In his leadership role with a major U.S. utility for nearly 30 years, which is how his name is familiar to me, he brings to Phillips Lytle insight, analytics, and business perspectives on long-term policies and the economic landscape. David Flynn has the pleasure of trying to moderate this group, and he is a partner at Phillips Lytle. He's the practice team leader for the firm's energy environment and nanotechnology practice teams. He concentrates on regulatory compliance consultations and brownfield redevelopment. Daniel McGuire is an associate at Phillips Lytle. He concentrates his practice in the area of civil litigation with a focus on commercial litigation matters, including breach of contract claims, construction disputes, uniform commercial code claims, toxic torts, and class actions. And last, but certainly not least, Thomas Puckner, who may have traveled the furthest to be here, uh, he is a partner at Phillips Lytle. He's the co-leader of the Phillips Lytle Energy Law Practice Team. Mr. Puckner assists with all matters related to development of renewable energy projects, including compliance with the seeker and related land use laws. Welcome, gentlemen, and we look forward to your comments. Thank you and good morning and welcome. Uh, we're all happy to be here this morning to present on a very interesting topic. But I would be remiss if I didn't do a little myth busting. And you all know Greg Peterson probably, but giving Greg Peterson uh, credit for all of this work is, is completely inappropriate. He's the big picture guy. He said, we're going to do solar, and you guys take care of it. So that's how we got here. <clears throat> so if it's good, you can, you can uh, give us the kudos. If you have an issue with it, it was all Greg's idea. But anyhow, we're, we're all very pleased to be here this morning. Um, energy is an interesting topic, and solar energy is a slice of that. But so much is going on in this space right now that we felt collectively it was an important time to get out and talk about what's happening in the energy space and with solar energy. You may have heard uh, recently, uh, within the last few months, the uh, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act was signed into law. 
Others will be talking about that in more specific, but it's really a transformative, game-changing um, law that has really broad implications and long-term implications for anybody that uses energy. And I don't think there's anybody in this room that doesn't use energy in some form or fashion. So it's an important time to understand where, in particular, New York State is heading and to be a participant in the process, not just a passive wagon on the back of a horse that's careening down the street wildly, but being part of the process that steers and inputs into where is this law going and what is it going to require of us? What, is it, what are the economic implications? What are the social implications of what's coming down the pipe here? So it's a very important uh, time in the energy space and it's great that we have a chance to come here and speak with you this morning because we're going to identify some key areas where uh, some of the regulatory uh, changes are occurring, where there's opportunities to input, whether through the Public Service Commission, through, the, through your elected officials, all sorts of different opportunities that you need to be aware of so that you can be part of the process, which is what we're strongly encouraging people to do. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to ask Kevin Blake to come up and speak uh, first about the re legal and regulatory context of the uh, energy arena, including solar. All right. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I'm a little taller than most. so. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, for everyone, for, for joining us today, and thank you for the Jackson Center for having us here. Um, I, I want to just uh, briefly, before we um, dive in, um, you know, we have a fantastic panel here that's going to talk about um, this topic from a variety of different angles, um, the legal perspective, um, from an engineering perspective, zoning, tax. Um, but before we dive into that, I wanted to sort of set the stage and provide some context um, to help kind of keep us grounded and, and guide um, our discussion. Um, so uh, my name is, is Kevin Blake. I'm an associate at, at Phillips Lytle, and I practice primarily in the areas of, of state and federal regulation of electric and gas uh, utilities. Um, and prior to joining the firm, I, I worked for uh, sort of in and around various state public utility commissions um, across the country. Uh, most recently as a research associate, kind of tracking and analyzing how electricity policy has developed and evolved um, over the years. Um, and I'm a native of Western New York. I ultimately came home um, and uh, happy to be back here and where I've focused um, uh, primarily on how New York in particular is uh, evolving uh, our electric system. Um, and so um, I'm going to briefly touch on, on a few items. Um, as soon as I can figure out how to change the slides. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. Um, so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on a few, a few items. Um, first, providing some background um, on the evolution of how and why our electric system is designed uh, the way it is. Um, outlining how our system is configured, the key agencies and key players involved, um, and then into how New York is going to, uh, is planning on reforming that system, um, uh, talking about the reforming the energy vision uh, proceeding, uh, the clean energy standard, uh, and, and some of the goals that New York has established. Um, and then following my uh, portion of the presentation, Dennis Elsenbeck is going to uh, come in and talk about how the clean, uh, how the Climate Act ha has changed and may change this and, and radically um, uh, uh, accelerate uh, the goals that we've already established. Um, so uh, to start out, I just wanted to paint a picture of kind of the, the traditional utility system as it's evolved. Um, and it really starts uh, in the early uh, or late 1800s uh, with the second industrial revolution as we see uh, chemical plants, manufacturing facilities, um, the, the, uh, the growth of the electric industry as we know it. Um, and, uh, you know, during that early portion uh, of, of the, 19th, uh, uh, the late 19th century, um, we see a period where electric and gas companies uh, were, were, had a very limited regulation. 
Um, and, you know, if you look at old photos of, of New York City um, in this time period, you see it's often described as, you know, as a forest of poles. Um, you have um, single, you know, multiple companies competing um, for, to provide electric service um, to, to customers. Um, and it was a quite messy uh, system. Um, ultimately, um, by the early uh, 1900s, um, states began to take an active role in the regulation uh, of utility, utility companies. Um, and economists referred to this uh, industry as, as an example of a natural monopoly, um, where they recognize that there are efficiency gains um, and economies of scale if one company were to operate as the sole provider throughout the supply chain. And so this is how our system evolved under uh, what's called a vertically integrated um, structure where the utility owns uh, and operates all levels of the supply chain from generation to transmission to distribution all the way into uh, the customer's home or business. Um, and this was really a, a perfect system for, for what it was designed for, which was to, to, to provide rapid outgrowth of utility infrastructure. Um, and utility companies were compensated for building uh, uh, that infrastructure. They were uh, provided um, a, a guaranteed rate of return um, for infrastructure that was built, uh, that was prudently invested and built uh, uh, and, and entered into service. Um, and, uh, and as you can see on the far right side, uh, and, and uh, you know, the customer was, re was referred to as a rate payer. And today we still often refer to them as rate payers um, because that was essentially the relationship. You paid, you as a customer paid the rate. And that was, your, that was the extent of your role. Um, and as we'll get into uh, uh, in a few minutes, that, that's starting to change. Um, and so uh, in the, you know, by the late 80s, early 90s, um, this paradigm ha had changed. Um, and the economic logic had shifted such that the transmission um, of electricity still had characteristics that were uh, uh, that uh, were a, a natural monopoly uh, at its core, uh, but uh, attributes of, of generation um, no longer had those characteristics. Um, you know, due to certain technology changes, um, economics and, and deregulation um, of other industries um, led to uh, 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 more opportunities for market participants, particularly in the generation side of the business, um, to enter the market and provide competitive services. And so the structure that we have now um, in New York and many other states is, is deregulated in nature where the utility company no longer has a monopoly over the entire supply chain. Um, they're, they're primarily wires and poles companies. Um, and uh, you know, not all states elected to do this. Um, New York was, was one of the first and, and many, many certainly followed. Um, but uh, you know, this, this, pr this process of electricity deregulation um, uh, was, um, uh, you know, really st kind of uh, st started to, uh, was one of the first major transformations uh, from the original system, you know, that we built. Um, now, I want to fast forward uh, briefly through this, um, but, but uh, if we go to the New York utility landscape today, um, you see that restructuring of our electricity system um, in the 90s dramatically widened the number of, uh, of agencies and key players that are now involved in this, in this industry. So you no longer have simply the utility and the customer. We have um, a whole swath of, of agencies uh, and companies, and this is really just a snapshot of, of some of them. Um, but um, you have the Public Service Commission, uh, kind of which sits at the top uh, in terms of a regulatory standpoint. Um, they regulate and oversee, uh, you know, electric and gas uh, industries in accordance with the public service law. Um, you also have the independent system operator, um, which is the wholesale market operator um, that, uh, that basically manages the energy and capacity and transmission congestion across the state. Um, they operate about 11,000 miles of uh, high voltage transmission lines 
across the state, and their role is essentially to, to keep the lights on. Um, then you have the utility companies uh, uh, across the state, and, and uh, uh, there are six major uh, investor-owned utilities responsible primarily for um, serving customers, owning and operating distribution infrastructure, um, uh, but not owning uh, generation. Um, and then we have NYSERDA uh, in the bottom corner, um, which is a unique um, public benefit corporation uh, established in New York that, that funds uh, uh, different programs, um, technical expertise, um, clean energy, uh, clean energy development to encourage uh, those technical or technological um, uh, uh, revolution. Um, and you know, certainly we also have municipal and cooperative utilities um, in the mix as well. Um, so uh, that was a very quick overview of a very long history, um, but I think it's important just to, to set the stage. Um, so I wanted to fast, kind of, uh, this is sort of a, an interesting um, a, a pr one way to look at it. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that um, th th over the last 130 years, there's obviously been, you know, many storms and natural uh, disasters. And really there's two that stand out as, as being uh, um, uh, revolutionary from an energy standpoint. Um, one is, was obviously a very long time ago, um, the blizzard of 1888. Um, this was back, uh, you can sort of see where, where there were multiple um, companies, uh, wires and poles companies competing. You can see sort of the, um, the messy system that evolved. Um, and following that blizzard, much of that infrastructure collapsed, uh, was forced to be uh, relocated underground, uh, and it was part of the impetus for establishing um, state regulation of utilities to create um, sort of an organization to, to the chaos. Um, uh, and then flashing forward um, to 2012, Hurricane Sandy um, had a similar effect on New York, um, where we see uh, extensive economic damage um, uh, to, to New York City in particular. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, um, this is particularly exacerbated in a, in a world where we live in a digital economy. Um, you know, the, the New York Stock Exchange was down for I believe two consecutive days uh, in 2012, um, which is only the second time that's happened, and, and the first time was actually in, in 1888. Um, but the the, the economic um, uh, uh, effects of this storm and increasingly severe weather events um, spawned uh, an opportunity for New York to reevaluate the system that it had built over the last 130 years, um, and. These storms combined with a uh, convergence of other factors is what ultimately led to what we now know as reforming the energy vision. Um, and some of those factors include uh, replacing aging infrastructure, uh, particularly uh, downstate, um, uh, the, the need for reliable uh, service, um, physical and cyber security threats, uh, and the advancement, of course, of, of distributed energy technologies, um, solar, wind, storage, and so on. Um, and there's also an increasing fear uh, of a dependence, uh, an over-dependence on gas uh, due to price volatility. And so these, all these factors were cited in, in the Public Service Commission's report that ultimately kicked off the, the REV proceeding. Um, and uh, so, so what, is, what is reforming the energy vision? That's sort of the, the, the question uh, that we have been trying to uh, solve uh, and, and move forward over the last uh, five years. Um, I think this slide sums it up nicely. Um, and this is from the uh, New York Department of Public Service report from 2014. Um, and it says, you know, addressing these challenges involves questioning two assumptions of this traditional paradigm that we just talked about. Uh, one, that there's no role for customers to play. The traditional assumption is customers are, are rate payers. You pay your rate, you turn on your light, and that's the end of the relationship. Um, that's being challenged under REV. The second is um, that the centralized generation model where you have sort of one directional power flow from power, power plant to a customer um, is, the most, uh, is the most cost effective due to economies of scale. That's also being challenged. Um, we now are moving towards a system that's bi-directional where customers can participate and be a part of the system uh, in many different ways than they traditionally uh, could in the past. Um, 
So I want to also share this slide. This is from NARUC, uh, National Association of Regulatory Utility uh, Commissioners. They're a, um, a nonprofit um, uh, group that represents all state uh, public utility commissioners across the country. Um, so this is certainly not an issue that's unique to New York. This is happening um, on, a, on a national and, and a global scale. Um, but uh, Nehru, uh, uh, in their um, Distributed Energy uh, Resources Manual, um, describes this uh, quite well. They say, you know, simply put, the term resource has traditionally referred to a resource for electricity generation, but when compared to the traditional central generation model, it could be said that a distributed model is turning the traditional model upside down by integrating new resources at and connected to the distribution grid. So the question is, what, is this, what does this new system ultimately look like? Um, and that's in a large part to be determined over the next uh, several years. But um, it may look something like this, um, where you now have um, supply and demand as, as, as elastic uh, and malleable. Um, you know, you're allowing um, greater system efficiencies um, by locating resources at different portions of the grid. Um, and uh, I think most notably and most striking about this, uh, this arrangement is you'll see that there are new opportunities for market entrants uh, all across the spectrum. Um, so you have opportunities for wind and solar, battery companies, um, and then also at the, um, at the demand side. Um, you know, the electric grid, you know, is now comprised of, of technologies that, um, you know, that can be integrated into the whole. So that encompasses everything from having a, a, a smart meter in your home, uh, managing your, your demand and your efficiency, um, an electric vehicle, LED light bulbs, um, you know, uh, uh, technologies that are, that are centered in the home and the business. Um, so you see now you have a, a, a system where um, there's two directional flow and there's much more customer participation. So customers are no longer rate payers in this system. Customers are actually, um, they actually pit play a key integral role um, in this process going forward. Um, but reforming 100 years of this history is certainly um, uh, not easy. Um, there are, you know, political and economic hurdles to reforming the system, um, and uh, it's exceptionally difficult because, uh, unlike many industries uh, or, or many, um, uh, uh, you know, technologies or, or uh, you know, or entities, the electric grid cannot just be shut off and rebuilt overnight. Um, this is a system that needs to be. Uh, maintain reliable service throughout the entire transition. And obviously, replacing a uh, 100-year-old system um, while keeping it running simultaneously in a safe and secure manner is a challenging task. Um, and so New York um, uh, initiated the REV proceeding in, in 2014 to address some of these challenges. Um, so I'll just run through some of the high-level policy objectives of, of REV. Um, uh, they essentially boil down to uh, enhanced customer knowledge, um, animating the markets, leveraging a new market participants, um, uh, improving system-wide efficiency, uh, fuel and resource diversity, uh, system reliability, um, and reduction in carbon emissions. Um, so the question is, how do they? How are? How is the state going to get there? Um, and so Rev is 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 divided into two tracks uh, at a very broad level. Um, and uh, track one uh, addresses um, one, of the one of the fundamental problems, which is um, as we see um, you know, improved technology and economics continuing to er erode the utility's natural monopoly, um, you're seeing that the, 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 there are questions. What is, what is the role of the utility in the next 30, 40 years? Um, and this is an issue that the Public Service Commission continues to, to grapple with. Um, and uh, the, the answer, uh, conceptually at this point, is um, utilities become um, distributed system platform providers. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, they they, they uh, essentially, um, the utility takes the role of, of sort of optimizing and managing distributed energy resources across the grid. Um, so the exact contours of that are yet to be defined, but in concept, that's, that's how it would work. Um, track two uh, addresses sort of the second fundamental uh, question here, which is um, 
you know, so if we've now determined what the role of the utility is going to be, um, uh, how are utilities supposed to make money under this system? Um, because traditionally, uh, the incentive for utilities is to, uh, um, is to build capital intensive projects. Um, they earn a rate of return on what they build. Um, if, if they're not building projects and they're managing a more efficient grid, how are utilities supposed to make money and stay in business and operate you know, a safe and reliable system? And so track two of REV is addressing what changes can be made uh, uh, you know, to the regulatory and tariff and market design um, to better align the utility interests with new and emerging uh, technologies. Um, and the answer, in, in, again, in concept, is, is performance-based regulation. So you're incentivizing the utility to perform in a certain way, um, as opposed to incentivizing them to just build infrastructure. Um, and so out of, this, uh, out of these two tracks uh, has evolved uh, uh, <laughs> an enormous array of proceedings, um, which has become uh, incredibly complex. Uh, there are at least uh, 15 to 20 uh, REV-related dockets at the Public Service Commission. Um, uh, there are many more uh, beyond this, this initial list. Um, and uh, uh, it becomes uh, an, an incredibly difficult task to track and understand um, how each one of these dockets uh, affects um, your, your interests, your clients' interests. Um, but they involve, as you can see, they involve uh, a number of topics, uh, electric vehicles, energy storage, energy efficiency, offshore wind, um, how, uh, how do you value distributed energy? Um, how, do you, uh, how do you ensure low-income customers are protected? Um, how, do you manage, uh, de how do you manage demand? Um, how do you create new product offerings for, uh, for customers to, to participate in this model? Um, all of that is currently being uh, discussed and is evolving um, at, at the Public Service Commission. And then finally, um, in, in 2016, uh, the, the Public Service Commission established uh, the Clean Energy Standard, which, uh, is a, uh, which essentially creates enforceable requirements um, for the state to meet uh, and support its policy objectives. And so this is where New York uh, established its in initial goal of 50% renewable energy um, by 2030. Um, and they did that by, uh, primarily by establishing a program of renewable energy credits. And so each load serving entity, uh, utilities, um, energy service companies, anyone that serves customers, um, they have to purchase renewable energy credits um, uh, from certain new resources that were built after 2015. So this is just basically designed to incentivize new projects coming online, ensuring that they'll have a source, a source of revenue. Um, it also established a zero emission credit program, or ZEX, which, is, uh, which are um, designed to uh, maintain uh, the uh, nuclear power fleet in New York, um, which is important for meeting uh, uh, New York carbon reduction goals. Um, so that, that's a very high level um, kind of overview of where, where New York stands, kind of how we got um, from point A to point B. Um, and what's important to note of all of this, I think, is that um, it's, it, there's a lot of moving parts to it. It's changing very, very quickly. Um, but there are avenues of participation that customers and businesses and clients should be aware of because these, these rules are being made today and they will impact electric rates and electric structures for the next 50 years, most of our careers. Um, and uh, all of that uh, is about to change, potentially, um, under the new Climate Act, um, which could rapidly accelerate um, these goals in the way that they're accomplished. Um, and so I'll turn it over to Dennis, uh, who's going to give a little more insight on that. And, uh, Right. Right. Yep. Good morning. Good morning. Now for something a little different. The engineer in the room. So the so when I first joined Phillips Lytle, uh, David Flynn asked if I could participate, uh, and he said, "Well, Dennis, uh, nobody really understands this because it, it's really complex." And I said, "If it continues to be complex." No, no goals will be achieved. It just won't happen. 
So we have to get more of an understanding, not just of the policies and the legal perspective that's out there, but what are we really trying to solve for? You know, you can fix anything. The least of my worries in the world today is technology and the engineer. Engineers can build anything. All it takes is money. So I want to kind of hit on, on some of what's happening, and I like pretty graphics, if you don't mind, because I think they really uh, allow you to see uh, what we're trying to do. I think the first thing we ought to do together is come up with a better acronym for the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. You know, if you try and say that three times real fast, you'd probably all pass out, and I, I'd be joining you. So, so we really got to think about kind of like what's behind it and what does it mean and, and, and then go from there because I think it's important. So I'll, I'll refer to it and I think Kevin actually referred to it as the Climate Act and I'll do the same. Kevin mentioned uh, a number of the issues that's happening with the traditional utility structure. This is the way it was set up, set up with a centralized system. And back in the early 90s, uh, it was a vertically integrated utility that owned generation, transmission, distribution, and then service and commodity directly to the consumer. Today, uh, the focus is on decentralization, which was one of the original tenets of the uh, reforming the energy vision. So what they were focused on was the generation side. And why is that? If you look at it from the point of view of competition, if you have more supply and you keep demand constant, what should happen to prices? Should go down. Have they? Yeah, they have. But not because of deregulation. They've had because of the, the lower cost of natural gas and most of the production that's built today at the margin is natural gas generation. So we have to think about that transition. So the whole idea is to remove uh, or to move uh, generation closer to the load source. That's decentralization is the co-location of supply and demand. And when Rev was first announced, uh, the DEN, the, den, the, the uh, uh, chair at the time had mentioned that due to the age of the infrastructure, and that's the transmission and distribution, it would cost the utilities across New York $30 billion to bring our transmission and distribution system up to speed so that we're delivering safe, reliable service. $30 billion. So we focused on that. The other thing that was focused on and why decentralization was key, if you look at the transmission and distribution side, by the time you generate a kilowatt hour, it's a 70% system. So you're actually losing 30% of what you just generated by the time it gets to the end user. So there's a concept of how do we co-locate supply and demand. And I'm bringing these up is because we're really not doing that. We're, we're, we're creating a number of solar farms that, uh, and wind farms. Uh, so we're still relying on the transmission and distribution system. So we want to really think about how are we balancing the system so that we're actually providing an efficient uh, delivery process that, that optimizes the supply chain. So the Climate Act created some pretty aggressive goals, and I'll, I'll describe why they're, I consider them aggressive. Uh, but it also, if you look at the, the picture here, we still retain the nuclear power, and that, as Kevin pointed out, is actually has some sponsorship called ZEX, which is zero emission credits, which is kind of compelling because that's a very traditional centralized system. Uh, the 70% renewable energy mix is, is put out there, um, and I'll, I'll give you some reference points. Uh, the technology goals, 9 gigawatts, that's 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind, 6 gigawatts or 6 million kilowatts of distributed solar, and then three gigawatts of battery storage are part of the goals, along with the creation of a climate action uh, panel, uh, council, that people should really consider as an opportunity to get the market voice into the process to the degree that you can. 
uh, the uh, council will be made up of uh, state agency leaders. Uh, the DEC will play a major role in that, along with the Public Service Commission. So individuals that will be on that will be developing a scoping plan that will actually put together the framework of how to implement these very much aggressive goals. And then em emissions goals, uh, and that's 60% uh, of 1990 levels uh, by 2030, and then at 15% of 1990 levels by 2050. So you ask, well, what is comprised of our emissions in New York State? 46% is transportation, 19% is residential buildings, 17% uh, electric power, 13% commercial buildings, and then 5% industrial. So when you look at, we're setting, let's say we want to pick out the 70% renewable energy goal. So how are systems actually developed when the utilities build a new transmission or distribution line? It's actually built at the peak of, of the transmission or the need of the marketplace. So if you look at the graphic here, the top graph, it says design requirement. That's how uh, the transmission system is built today. It's also how supply systems are designed as well. So 70% of that peak that actually only occurs probably 20 to 30% of the year. So you're designing systems that actually are short-lived in terms of, what, of their total requirements. If I look at trying to balance the system before I actually build more supply, I would look at uh, energy storage or thermal storage or battery storage. I'd balance the system, which is the line to the left, and then my 70% goal still is retained, but I need less renewable energy to, to achieve that. That's called balancing the system of looking at both the supply side and the demand side. So if you look at where we are with these goals, from 2004 to 2018, renewable resources increased from 19.3% to 27%. That was 15% to increase our supply of renewable energy by 8%. With the Climate Act goal at 70%, we want to go from 27% to 70% by 2030. That's a 43% increase over an 11-year period. That's what I mean by kind of aggressive, aspirational, we better get going sort of thing. So, so you say, geez, are we on track? Well, then you look at the queue, the projects that are actually in the queue. So as long as all municipalities are comfortable, all permitting goes really smoothly, all seeker is just wonderfully uh, smooth and absolutely no bumps and grinds as we go forward, we actually have a shot. Because that's what we have on the books. The last slide I want to talk about is, is kind of like another point about the system and how it's designed. So if you look at this, this map, uh, Brad Jones, who was the president and CEO of the New York ISO two years ago, uh, he has since moved on. He brought out this, this concept of the tale of two grids. If you look at the middle of that uh, New York State map, there's these yellow jaggedy lines. <laughs> What that is is a transmission constraint, meaning that the power that we're trying to drive from western New York through those yellow jagged lines cannot happen because there's a constraint. And what is a constraint? It's a, uh, a big wire going to a little wire or a big hose going to a little hose. There's, you can't push as much power as you need because if you think about it, where's the real demand in New York? Downstate. You know that whooshing noise as you're driving down the thruway? That's the electrons f trying to fly uh, down to New York State to feed that growing demand. And it's, and it's actually intense and incredible. So if you look at western New York or west of that constraint, what we have is low demand relative to the eastern side of New York State. We have a high concentration of renewable energy, 
but not an ability of actually moving the power west to east. 60% of the renewable energy credits that were given a few years back were west of the constraint. So we have to think about what we're actually solving for in that particular case. On the eastern side of the state, you got high demand, but you also have a high fossil concentration, and you have relatively high prices. And that's because most of your low-cost supply is west of that constraint. And so there's a lot of activity east of, that, east of the constraints to actually balance the system. Some other facts. So today, if you look at the first quarter of 2019, there's about 1,700 megawatts worth of solar generation uh, here in New York State. To reach that uh, 6,000 megawatts of distributed solar by 2025, we got to triple our solar generation. So this topic today is really key because we're not going to triple any of our solar generation by, use, by placing solar on rooftops. So the pressure will continue to bear on utility grade solar projects, large solar farms, and really the need for all of us to pull together in order to think about the technology and the policy so that we're actually moving our projects forward. If we do not solve the marriage between technology and the real constraints that we have on our system, it will end up costing the consumer more. It is just fact. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, so I'm going to bring Tom Puckner up, who's going to talk about where all of these regulatory and policy changes are taking um, the energy industry, with some particular emphasis on project developers and how projects are developed. Thank you, David. Okay, as, as I mentioned, uh, my name is Tom Puckner. I'm an energy attorney and co-leader of the energy practice team at Phillips Lytle. I spend uh, a good chunk of my time helping developers uh, to work on projects like solar projects and getting them through the process. Uh, and when I'm not doing that, most of the time I'm doing work that Kevin, the type of stuff that Kevin was talking about, utility regulatory and energy regulatory work at um, Public Service Commission or at FERC or at the independent system operator. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the development and energy regulatory side of getting these types of projects built. So there's, um, just starting at the high, high level, three types of solar that you have in New York. You have the, the first part that Dennis just said is not going not to get us where we need to go, traditional rooftop solar. You have um, commercial scale solar, which is most of what we see in, in our communities, and then you have really large scale utility scale solar. Um, so for traditional net metering, what you're talking about is those panels on the roof or in the ba on the back of the property serving that local need at, at that property and spinning that meter backward with anything that's not used on that, in that location, generating a credit for that utility uh, meter owner. It literally spins the meter backwards. And that concept is what's behind most of the solar that's going to get built. Um, Commercial scale solar actually has two types. Um, one is called remote net metering for really, for it's focused mostly on large utility users and community distributed generation or community solar, which is the main, that's the, the bulk of the energy, the solar projects that are gonna be built and that you see happening are community solar. That's where the, the action is. These are all credit based systems, okay? They're all behind what we call behind the meter in that they're not selling the energy as a commodity into the, to the electric grid. The excess is going to the utility, being used, but it's generating a credit. So it's not a sale of energy in that sense. They're not a merchant project. Um, remote net metering is this um, under public service law 66J, which is the statute that enables net metering in general, but it has one provision in it that allows a large utility user to have a project located off-site 
with a meter. That project is just a solar project, so it's not using a lot of energy. All of the energy that's uh, generated is creating credits that are then applied to that business's um, utility meters at, at the various meters that it has. Many of them have many meters. If you have you know, a SUNY campus, there's many meters there, lots of energy usage, and the credits are then reducing or offsetting completely the utility bill at that location. So that's remote net metering. Um, and that was really the first solar, large-scale solar play in New York. The statutory cap for that is two megawatt projects, which is a big, big project for, you know, you have to have a large user for that. And community net metering was created by an order of the Public Service Commission interpreting that statutory authority for remote net metering. Um, and it enables um, those credits to be, um, that same type of off-site large solar farm can generate credits for anybody. You don't, and you don't have to have a rooftop anymore for solar. You don't have to have a back 40 for the panels to be in your yard. You could be a renter. You could be a condo owner. You could be a business owner, anybody. So that, that really opens the door for access to solar in New York and creates a, a juggernaut of, of interest. Those projects originally were based on that statutory two megawatts. They've been increased now to five megawatts. And that, just to give a sense of scale, that's around 600 to 1,800 homes worth of um, solar energy credits in, in one project. Um, so how are these projects uh, handled in terms of their review and permitting? Community net metering, community solar, remote net metering projects, all of these are like any other project that comes to your community. They're, they're handled through zoning and local permitting, state permits. And it's all done under the context of the State Environmental Quality Review Act, or SEEKER. Then you have large-scale solar. This is the, the big, big projects. Um, and there's really two types. There's anything over that 5 megawatts up to 25 megawatts, which kicks in a different type of review. Um, and then you have anything over 25 megawatts. Both of these are merchant projects that are selling energy into the wholesale market or to, through private purchase agreements. And the permitting process differs depending on that, that over 25 or under 25. So again, the 5 to 25 are too large for the, the 5 megawatt and under interconnection process. They use an interconnection process through the wholesale market, the New York ISO. Most of those are going to be 20 megawatts. 25 megawatts and over, these are the big, big projects. Currently, there's a couple that are proposed up to 350 megawatts. Most of them are 100 to 200. And permitting, for, again, for that smaller group, the 5 to 20, 25, that's also just like any other project. It's seeker zoning at the local level. The larger ones that are over 25 megawatts, now you're talking about the public service law, Article 10, with the New York State uh, Board on Electric Generation siting in the environment, generally just called the siting board. Um, the siting board is intended to be a streamlined process for these larger projects. It's a centralized permitting process. All of the state and local approvals are issued through the siting board, through their cert certification process. It preempts the local and state permitting, permitting pr procedures that otherwise would apply. But all of the substantive requirements of those local laws, all the substantive requirements of the state laws still have to be complied with unless the siting board determines that they're unreasonably burdensome. Now, so far, since Article 10 has been in place, there's been only a few projects that have made it through. Um, and in terms of the, that override, the only things they've really found unreasonably burdensome has been kind of construction constraints, what time you can do construction, what days, that type of thing. <clears throat> so again, most projects, that, that's the background of what types, most projects are going to be community solar and um, less than or equal to about five megawatts or less. That's local review and permitting, and that's the, the primary regulatory mechanism is going to be the State Environmental Quality Review Act. So having said all that, I'm going to give a little bit of a background on how SEEKER works and, and how SEEKER is handled for these projects. The purpose of SEEKER is to incorporate environmental considerations into agency decision making. And it's not all approvals, it's not all environment, it's a 
balancing, the statute calls for a balancing of social, economic, and environmental considerations. The basic rule of seeker is that no agency can take a discretionary approval or make that approval without first considering the environmental impacts. And the question that's asked is, is this action going to have a significant adverse impact on the environment? If it is, an environmental impact statement must be performed. It doesn't mean you can't do the project. It means you need to perform an environmental impact statement. <coughs> and seeker, importantly, people often confuse this. Seeker is not a permit. Seeker is a process that needs to be done by law before permits can be issued. <coughs> so the first question that's always asked is, does seeker apply? You need to have an agency that's taking an action. What's an agency? It's a, under seeker, it's a state or local agency. And that could be a state department, it could be NYSERDA, it could be the DEC, it could be the Public Service Commission, or the town board, or the county IDA. <coughs> seeker is triggered by, thank you, seeker is triggered by involved agencies. Um, that's the, the main hook. An involved agency is an agency with a discretionary approval involved in the project. So solar project involved agencies are typically going to be, again, like I mentioned, it's the local review. It's going to be your town board, potentially depending on how solar, the, um, the code in the town is set up, planning board, most of the time it's the planning board, or the zoning board of appeals. <clears throat> and that's through the zoning laws, special permit, site plan, sometimes subdivision, depending on what's going on, or rezoning or zoning amendment. Other involved agencies at the state level, the main one is NYSERDA because they're, they're issuing funding for almost every solar project. And then at the local level, other involved agencies are the IDA typically, or town board or school board if there's a, a, a payment in lieu of taxes that's being negotiated or there might be IDA funding. Last thing, uh, sometimes there's a host community benefit agreement. It's, it's often tied to um, the pilot agreements, and those contracts are considered actions under seeker, so that's also a trigger for an involved agency. So interested agencies are agencies that don't have that discretionary approval. They have some involvement, but they don't have a discretionary approval. In terms of solar projects, DEC most of the time actually is only an interested agency. The stormwater program that these projects have to comply with is really a set of standards no different than the building, the building code. So if the project engineers design it to meet the code, they f do their filing, it meets standards and it can discharge sol uh, stormwater, it's not a discretionary approval in the same way as a special permit from a, t a planning board. Um, SHPO, State Historic Cultural Resources Review, also it's more of a consultation process. It's not a discretionary approval, so that's an interested agency. It doesn't have a jurisdictional hook. Last one is the County Planning Board Review process. That's a consultation about intermunicipal impacts. It's not a discretionary approval. So, Again, you need an agency and you need an action. Those actions are the discretionary approvals that I talked about. For solar projects, these are going to be your zoning approvals, your payment in lieu of taxes or IDA financing, and NYSERDA funding. It's not the general municipal law referral, it's not stormwater, and it's not SHPO um, cultural resources review. Projects need to be classified under seeker as the first step in the process when a, when a solar project comes into a town. And there's three levels of categories that seeker projects have. The first one is a type one action. Those are the largest projects and there's a long list of categories that have to be reviewed to, term, to determine whether it's a type one action. And that has a certain path in the seeker regulations. Type two actions are actions that are actually exempt. Once you determine you're a type two action, you check the box and you're done, your project can move forward. Unlisted action is anything else that has a discretionary approval by an agency, but it's not type one. Still have to do seeker, it's just a different process 
So solar projects, commercial-scale solar projects like community solar, are almost always going to be type one actions, which is the more fulsome seeker review. And that's for a simple reason. They almost all require 10 acres of site disturbance to fit those solar panels to have the solar access that you need. Um, but again, type one under the regs, type one means that it's more likely to require an environmental impact statement, but it doesn't mean that it actually has to do an environmental impact statement. You know, often someone at a meeting will stand up and say, well, this needs an environmental impact statement. It's a type one action. No, it just means that it's more likely to need that and it follows a different process. In fact, in our experience, and I don't check this every day, I'm only aware of uh, one solar project in New York of the non-Article 10 size that has needed an environmental impact statement. That was a large project on Long Island. And um, I think that it probably was over the Article 10 trigger size, but predated Article 10 and was grandfathered. And there's some wind projects that also had that same status. They're large enough that they should have been Article 10, but they were grandfathered because they started the process before. Okay, so that's the general background of how solar projects are handled under Seeker. There's a couple of new amendments, and this will lead into what Dave has to say. Um, DEC, looking at state policies, looking at their knowledge of impacts of solar projects, has added some type two actions in the most recent changes to the regs. These are projects are exempt essentially from seeker review. You can have up to 25 acres of solar arrays on a closed landfill on some brownfield sites and state superfund sites subject to conditions. Um, currently disturbed areas at wastewater treatment plants, disturbed areas on industrial zone properties, parking lots and garages, and also existing structures provided they're not historic. So huge opportunity to get a lot of solar into our neighborhoods and areas that are um, you know, pretty ideal for, for solar without having to go through the burden of uh, seeker review. You still have permits that have to be approved, but it's not a seeker process. So a couple of challenges that we've seen out there in working on solar, moratoria. Um, often new development comes to town of a different type than has, has been seen before, may not be expressly provided for in the town's codes, and people decide it's time for a moratorium so we can study this issue. Very common thing, happened a lot during the natural gas uh, period early, maybe five years ago. Um, before that, we saw it a lot out in Albany where I live for uh, gravel, sand and gravel projects. So um, it, it puts a pause on a certain type of development for a period of time while it can be studied. There are uh, good cases on this that have sort of put parameters on how long they can be and on what occasions you can have them. So that, that creates a little bit of a push-pull. Obviously, if you're a developer coming to town and you've put your chips down or you've worked on a project, it creates some risk and uncertainty for projects and investments if all of a sudden you might not be able to go forward. So there's a little bit of discussion that happens around that because of those laws that define, the, the cases that define when you, can't have, when you can and can't have a um, moratorium. Most moratoria laws have um, some sort of due process uh, escape mechanism that allows for a waiver or a variance from the process if you're far enough along. It's no different than any other zoning law. So if, if, you've, if you've built your house or you've begun building your house and suddenly the town changes the code to say, this is a green space area, you gotta have a way to deal with that. And that's the same is true for moratoria. Lack of zoning is an issue that comes up a lot of times developer will come to town, the town won't have a provision that expressly deals with solar in their code, and people will say, well, what do we do? Do we adopt a law? What do we do? Sometimes um, the, the solar code in the town will actually be too restrictive for the project as these things develop. Um, you had laws that were designed around two megawatt projects. Now they can be up to five. What are you going to do? So zoning amendments is another action subject to seeker. When that happens, it needs to be carefully coordinated with the project to make sure that seekers handled properly. Importantly, a solar code amendment may not be necessary 
to handle a project that's coming to town, often zoning codes from, for many years have had utility use or um, electric generating use provisions in them and a project can, can be easily handled and um, fully reviewed using just that. We've done a bunch of those. <clears throat> Lastly, uh, clearing issues. You may have uh, a nice area, open field, where a project is proposed, but in that location, nothing needs to be cleared, but you're going to see it. You may have another area where there's, it's very well screened because it's a wooded area. No one's going to see the project when it's built, but you have to clear trees to do it. Um, there's no clear, although there's very clear policy that we want lots of solar, there isn't a clear policy of which one is the preference. And so you'll often see we've had projects within five miles of each other. Literally, we don't want to use a little bit of ag soil, and we're going to see the project, so that one's dead. Over here, you're going to clear six acres of trees, even though no one will see it except they're in an airplane. We don't want the project because we don't want to clear trees. These are perfectly acceptable um, policies of local municipalities, but there's nothing to guide them, and that's just the nature of New York zoning. So <clears throat> the last thing that I'll mention, uh, didn't have time to talk about today, is what types of approaches in zoning are there to deal with solar. The packet includes a couple of different examples. There's some model laws that have been published. There are some other examples in there from other towns. Um, <clears throat> I'll just say those are examples. We're not necessarily advocating for any of them. Uh, and if, if you're going to adopt a, a solar law, use experienced counsel and use planners that have experience. So <clears throat> that gets to the, what I call the solar disconnect, which is a little bit of a pun for the disconnect that you have when you install a solar project. Um, I talk to clients all the time that are coming from out of state. They've developed in other places where it's very easy to get things done. They have this perception that it's green development should be easy. What are the impacts of this? The state has these lofty goals. We're ready to go to New York. And it's clean technology. But they get here and it's, it's a burdensome, long process because it's a secret process. So why is something so difficult even though it's so good? And the answer is, this is just how we do it in New York. <laughs> it's that simple. Um, but putting the rhetoric aside, the reality is all of these projects are these, what I mentioned, the over 10 acre projects. They're type one projects. That is going to always trigger multiple agencies having a, a piece of the review. It's the most extensive environmental review that you can have in New York, except for the Article 10 projects. So it's naturally a difficult process, and, and it should be a difficult process. We want to make sure that these are uh, good projects for our, our communities. <clears throat> so that's all I have. I'll just say um, our best practices are to expect detailed review, to do a good, good, do your homework on these projects on both sides of the table, uh, rely on experienced counsel and professionals, and um, to build relationships across the table. When, when it's done on a, a cooperative basis, with uh, good experts, it always produces the best results. So that's it. That's all I have. Um, I'll let Dave talk about brownfields. Yeah. We, so where we are right now is we've gone through the process of identifying sites and developing a project. Now the thing that's near and dear to the hearts of local government is how do we get our piece of the pie? And uh, how do we, um, from a property tax perspective, how do we handle solar projects, whether they're relatively modest, two megawatt projects, up to uh, very large projects. And Dan McGuire is going to talk to us about that because, uh, uh, as has been the case in some other areas of solar development, it's kind of all over the place. And while the state has attempted to take some control by opting in this opt-in, opt-out process, it's, a, in my view, it's as murky as it's ever been in terms of how do you assess a solar project, and, and how, do you, how do you come up with a tax burden that helps the community but also allows a project to proceed? And Dan's going to talk to us about that. 
Thanks, Dave. Uh, my name is Dan McGuire. I'm an associate at Phillips Lytle. I practice primarily in litigation, but as part of my litigation, I do a variety of tax certiorari matters for local property owners working through the normal um, tax assessment process, which I'm sure most of you may be aware of. And I think it's helpful to just go through that basic process before we get into the solar, just so you have a foundation on which to understand where the, sol where the solar tax exemption comes in. So in New York, how it works is that you have towns and municipalities have their assessors. They go out, they determine some, they assess your property, they determine a fair market value of that property, then some sort of equalization rate gets it, that gives you your assessment value, and then the town looks at the total amount of property that's assessed in, in the municipality, how much is that, and they determine what their tax levy is. And in the solar energy context, In the solar energy context, what New York has decided to do that Dave mentioned, mentioned is to kind of come up with this grand bargain. You know, throughout the presentations today, we've heard a lot about how New York wants to try to incentivize solar development. It wants to attempt to incentivize wind development. And in the process of doing that, there's some sort of push and pull where New York, the, the state wants to incentivize these projects, but they also want to let the municipalities retain some sort of control over these projects. And just as it is in the seeker process and the permitting process, that still exists in, in the tax context. So what, what does that mean? Basically, New York passed what's called NYRPTL 487, which provides that solar energy systems are tax exempt for a 15-year period. So the first issue is kind of what is a solar energy system? So clearly a solar energy system encompasses sort of the large scale projects that we've discussed, but it also encompasses, you know, passive solar energy. Um, you'll see cases out there of people getting tax exemptions for greenhouses or for buildings they put over their pools that are supposed to provide some sort of passive solar energy. Um, so they get an exemption for that. The other important thing to realize about this kind of general rule is that the exemption only applies to the solar energy system itself. So if you own you know, a 10 acre plot of land and you decide you're gonna build a solar energy project on it, the only portion that's gonna be tax exempt is the value added by the solar energy system itself. The property's still gonna get taxed. Um, so if the property is worth $100,000, still going to get assessed at $100,000, you're still going to get taxed on that $100,000. Now, if you build a solar energy system that's worth $2 million on top of that property, under the general rule, the default rule, that, that extra $2 million is going to be tax-exempt, tax but you'll still be taxed for that $100,000 value of the property. So municipalities can have, there's, there's two options municipalities have when, with respect to RPTL 487. The first is they can decide to opt out of it. And what do, so what does that mean? A municipality will pass some sort of resolution that says we're opting out of the solar energy exemption. If you come into our municipality, you build a solar energy project, we're going to tax that as if it was any other sort of real property in the town. And you can see, included in your materials, I've provided a list of municipalities and school districts that have opted out of the solar, of the solar tax exemption. So the, the, these, it, it, and it, it's not just the municipalities, it's the taxing jurisdiction. So that means um, the municipality can opt out, but also the school district could also opt out. And so you'll have cases in which um, maybe a property is situated in a space where the school district has not opted out, but the munis municipality has opted out, or vice versa. So it doesn't have to be consistent. Um, so once again, once a municipality opts out, uh, the options are limited. You're just 
it, it, the, the property and your solar system, your solar energy systems are just going to be taxed as if it's a normal piece of real property uh, in the municipality. And of course, you're going to have oftentimes, depending on where these are located, um, given their unusual nature, they're fairly ripe for some sort of assessment challenges because you have assessors who are working oftentimes in smaller villages, in smaller towns, in smaller municipalities, assessing pieces of property that they have very little um, familiarity with, right? It, it, assessing a solar energy system compared to assessing, you know, whether it's even an industrial building or a residential building are two very different things. And oftentimes, assessors may not have the technical expertise to assess um, a solar energy development. It's helpful for developers to get some sort of involvement early on in that process to help educate the assessor about this is what the fair market value of, of these projects are without the state. This is how much it costs to build it. This is how much rent and money this solar project generates. And from there, we can start to apply some sort of assessment principles to come to a fair market value. So if a municipality doesn't opt out of RPTL 47, that doesn't mean that they don't get to capture any of the revenue. Instead, what RPTL 487 allows is it allows um, RPTL 487 allows juris jurisdictions that are still offering the exemption to negotiate a pilot with the um, with the solar developer. So, what does that mean? It means that the solar developer. Once they decide they're going to locate in a, certain, in a specific municipality, they have the opportunity to go to the taxing jurisdiction and say, we're going to be here. We're interested in negotiating a pilot. You haven't um, opted out. So normally this property would be exempt, but let's talk about what our uh, payment in lieu of taxes is, right? So rather than being assessed in the normal process, we're going to agree on a price that I'm going to pay you um, rather than paying you kind of your normal property taxes. Um, you have a wide range of, because these are all separate taxing jurisdictions, you're going to have a wide range of what those payments are going to be. Um, oftentimes they're going to be based on that there, there's going to be a, an assign, it's going to be a percentage of the megawatts generated for each project. So, um, like it says, the annual pilot payments, they're going to relate to the size of the project. And if you look at here, this is just something put out by NYSERDA that's supposed to give a general overview uh, in a broad range of the type of pilot payments you could expect for a two megawatt um, community solar project in each of the jurisdictions where these are the main utilities. So, you know, for national grid, it's going to be western New York. And that's th those are the type of pilot payments you would be expecting to see on a two megawatt. And obviously, as the size increases, you're going to, um, those payments are going to get larger and larger. The last thing I'll mention with the solar energy, with the pilot payments is while the pilot payments give you a broad range of discretion, give the municipalities a lot of discretion in setting, setting what the pilot payment, there is an upper bound constraint on it, right? You cannot agree to a pilot payment that's going to exceed what would have been taxed on the property had it just been treated as a regular piece of property. So this isn't an opportunity, the pilot payment system isn't an opportunity for municipalities to say, well, you, you're not going to be taxed under the normal taxing process. And instead, we're going to charge you more than we would a normal property owner. That's not what it is. The purpose of the pilot payments is to allow these communities to make a decision to incentivize solar to come into their communities and reach an agreement with the developer at a price point in which it's going to incentivize the developer to come in there while still allowing the municipality to capture some of that, um, capture some of that revenue from that project. And that's all I have. I think Dave is going to talk about brownfields next. So we've seen a lot of interesting issues on the real property tax issue with projects. So 
you go into a, a relatively small community, the overall tax base is small, and you build a large solar project, and you look at that and you say the, the land is worth a couple hundred thousand dollars, but the solar project's worth four or five million dollars, and that becomes now one of the largest taxable pieces of property in that community. And as I'm sure a number of you folks are aware, in some of these smaller rural com communities, the tax rate per thousand is pretty high because the tax base is relatively low. So you can have a, an incredible spike hit a project that, make, that really challenges its economic viability and hence the need for um, a, an equitable pilot process. And the state recognizes that, and as Dan pointed out, there's some guidelines um, in terms of ranges of dollars per megawatt based on the size of a project that might make sense for a pilot. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it, is, it, it is ultimately discretionary. And as uh, I think it was Dan or Tom pointed out, you, know, you, you think of the state wanting to incentivize solar, but there's also this respect for home rule. So to this point, the state has not push that down in terms of mandatory approach to, um, to solar across the state, but it's going to continue to create this tension between uh, local municipalities seeing um, a pot of gold with a project or, or no project at all and the state wanting to move aggressively forward with ever increasingly large um, solar projects. And when you get into things like energy storage, which is even more capital intensive, where if you had a large energy storage facility on a piece of property, that could have 50 or $60 million worth of batteries or energy storage devices in that. What, what's gonna happen with those? And the, I don't think the RPTL envisions that, uh, an energy storage facility. So something's going to have to have to happen there, or these storage facilities aren't going to come online because, or they're going to be taxed as eighty million dollar projects, which probably won't work economically for the project. So, you're seeing where all these all these pressures are intersecting and bouncing off of each other, and you throw on top of that the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which is kind of putting the pedal to the floor. Uh, you know, on a car that the steering isn't working too well and the brakes are out, and you can see where everything is just sort of heading all over the place and something needs to bring all of this stuff back together and into focus or we're going to end up with a, an absolute mess. And that's one of the messages we want to leave you here today is that we need all of you, all of us to be involved in the process because it's, it's heading in a million different directions and no one's, no one's got the wheel. And we've got to collectively get some focus, make some priority decisions, make some economic and social decisions about what's more important versus less important and start to correct and, and guide the vehicle where it's going. One of those opportunities that we all collectively spend a lot of time on are projects on brownfields. And uh, when, when I was introduced, I uh, heard that I, I do a fair bit of brownfields work. But one of the interesting things with brownfields is that it, it can provide some interesting benefits to a community in terms of location of a solar project or uh, even a storage project too, but it can, it can provide community benefits without a lot of the, the, the downside. So, there we go. Sure I got the right page here. So, there's a lot of common community concerns with solar projects that you've, you've heard discussed here today. And at, at points, and the reason I bring it up here is a lot of these uh, concerns and issues really don't exist or are much less vexing in, a, in, a, in either a brownfield or a, a closed landfill type project. In terms of does a, does a project have community support, property value impacts, glare and visual impact, we hear these time and again for what I'll call greenfield solar projects. These are, these are concerns about that neighboring properties might have. Some of the litigation that's recently been commenced with regard to the Arkwright Wind Project obviously doesn't have the glare issue, it has the, the sound and noise issue, 
but its property value impacts and visual impacts. If you, if you move to a brownfield or look at a closed landfill, a lot of those issues go away um, or, or not, are not as, as troublesome. And they're just not as prevalent on landfills or brownfields because of the nature of the site. You also don't have some of the other concerns that uh, Tom in particular was mentioning. Tree removal is a big issue with a lot of sites. People have concern, they have trouble getting their heads around, you know, we're, we're doing this in part to improve the environment, yet we're clear cutting 40 acres of hardwood to do it. Uh, there, there, there's a, a jarring disconnect there at times, and you can understand where some of that concern comes from. If you have a brownfield or a closed landfill, if, they, if those trees were there, they're long, you know, long gone, so it's, it's not a concern. S similar with wildlife impacts. Agricultural impacts are some of the biggest issues we're seeing right now in a number of projects. So the, between local government and state government, they identify lands that are considered a prime, super good agricultural land. And if you want to do a solar project on uh, a piece of, of property that's so designated, you can get a lot of blowback from the local community because they have a, a strong tradition of agriculture and it's valuable land from a farming perspective. Equally, on the state side, there's this pressure. One, one branch of state government is saying more solar, the other is saying you're not gobbling up all of the good agricultural land to put solar panels. Another pinch point in this overall process we're going through. And again, from that perspective, brownfields have none of that. You're not, you're not growing crops on a brownfield, you're not growing corn on top of a closed landfill. And from a community integration perspective, they're off, often much easier to move forward. It's not as jarring that you have this pastoral hillside of trees and cows and cornfields and blah, there's 30 acres of bright, shiny panels. That's jarring. It's at times incompatible, and we see those issues raised with projects. But where are your brownfields and landfills? A lot of times it's, it's in, in industrial areas. It's in, in, it's in areas where these properties have been around for a long period of time. So the surrounding land uses have sort of grown in around them in a, in a, in a more compatible way than you might see on other properties. So brownfields and landfills can have a lot of benefits in terms of moving forward aggressively with solar projects. So developing solar projects and how, they bal how we balance uh, interests. So the, the, the communities themselves have local, concerned, local concerns and they want to guide development in, in their communities. And you want to drive benefits to the communities in turn, in, including tax revenues and property taxes as, we, as we've heard. And oftentimes there's a key component of looking to redevelop underutilized properties. Again, brownfields and landfills are oftentimes poster children for, for those types of properties where you have a, a piece of land, number one, it's, it's not producing any tax revenue for the, for the municipality. If it's owned by somebody, you may not, they may not be paying their taxes because it's a brownfield, and if they are, it's probably at a, at a relatively low rate. Similarly with landfills, they're just not, they're not spinning off a lot, of, a lot of tax dollars. Here's a way to bring some additional tax, um, taxable property into the community in a way that benefits the community, but doesn't have a lot of the same side effects that greenfield uh, solar development has. On the developer side, the developers crave predictability and certainty. And as Tom was mentioning in, in his presentation, you, you can pull into a town with a solar project and you're, you're almost clueless in terms of what's the reaction going to be. We've seen projects embraced. We've seen people picket and march out in front of town hall at the night of the meeting and everything in between. Um, and that's tough on developers because there's lots of upfront costs. Lots of dollars are spent before you know if you have a project. You've got to lay out your project, you've got to figure out if the grid can accept the energy that it will produce, and if it can, what are your costs to interconnect to the grid. All of these are costs that you have to incur oftentimes before you know you have a project. So 
a brownfield and a landfill give you an added uh, layer of predictability and certainty because the chances of strong community blowback are significantly less than saying I'm going to go clear cut this 40 acres of hardwood for my project and you're much, much more likely to elicit a negative response or just draw a lot of create a lot of work for yourself to try and get the project uh, to move forward. In terms of the clarity and guidelines and f flowing with the moving parts, it really just allows the developer to take the project and move it forward. And you don't end up in these stuck with a moratoria or you don't end up in mind-numbing litigation to try and break something through a planning board uh, decision. You're not stuck in a rezoning loop. Oftentimes, because it's a brownfield or landfill, the zoning is there. The zoning is, uh, is, is already in place to support a solar project. You may certainly still need some local approvals, but it's a much different level of effort and, and much more predictable to try and get a site plan approved for land that's already zoned and has, has a land use plan around it that in essence is compatible or supports solo, uh, solar, I'm sorry. And I think last but certainly not least in this column are, are the NIMBY issues. Um, the not in my backyard. Everybody loves solar, not everybody, but a lot of people love solar, just not where they can see it or not where they have to deal with it. Same with wind. Um, and if everybody thought that way, we wouldn't have anything, right, in terms of solar projects. But we, we experience a lot less of the NIMBY syndrome in our experience when you're dealing with brownfields and, uh, and landfills because look at who your neighbors are. They're the manufacturing plant that's across the street. They're the, the bus garage that's on the, you know, on the other side of the property, whatever it might, might, might be, versus single family homes or apartment buildings or along a, you know, a scenic waterway or something like that where there's a lot of concern and just a lot of negative energy hooked into the location. So in municipal code considerations and striking a, a balance, at, at one level you want to protect local interests, but you also, uh, if, you, if you want to move forward with an aggressive solar development scheme statewide, you have to provide a clear path for developers. This, the process has to become more, uh, more of a rote exercise. So many of these projects that we deal with today, they're all one-offs. And those are incredibly inefficient. You're looking at each project. What what should my pilot payment be? Oh well, we got to do we've got to do this. What you know? What's the process with the municipality? What's the process with NYSERDA? It it needs to become much more of a uh, a process that can be replicated readily across the state and across at least within certain utility jurisdictions, so that you can start to develop some economies of scale on a, on, a, on a broader basis to get more of these projects underway, or we have no hope of meeting any of the goals that, uh, that Dennis laid out. And you're also looking at reuse of contaminated and remediated properties. Those, those are prob the solar projects, in my view, for a lot of these properties are the highest and best use of those properties. You're not going to build anything on top of a closed landfill. You're not going to uh, many, many brownfields. Uh, you might be able to do something else with them, but again, the location and the size and the nature of the contamination that remains really limit and preclude what you can do. Um, a, a solar project may really be the highest and best use for the community, both from a, a, a land use and also an economic and tax perspective. And as Tom pointed out, the state has started some very in, in a very modest way to, to start to create some incentives amongst its other procedural aspects for, uh, for, for solar projects and, and, and making projects, solar projects on landfills and uh, brownfields a type two action and sort of kicking it out of the seeker process is, is certainly helpful in a step in that direction. There, there are, there are common challenges, however, to developing projects on landfills and brownfields. You're oftentimes putting your project on top of a cap or cover system, 
And depending on how you configure your system and, in, and, and put it in place, some are just not compatible with certain sites. So if you have a, a membrane liner over a closed landfill, you do not want a solar project that every 10 feet is putting a hole in that liner. That's the last thing you want as, a, as the owner of that landfill and, and the entity responsible for it. We have a client who's developed a, a racking system for solar panels that literally sits on, in large ballasted racks on top of the landfill so you avoid all those punctures. It's, it's things like that that you have to uh, have to design around and accommodate as part of a, a solar project on a, on a landfill or brownfield. You have, we talked about some of the other uh, approvals that are necessary for projects generally um, and at the local level and even the state, but because a number of these sites are remediated under either state or federal jurisdiction, those agencies, whether it's DEC in New York or EPA on the federal level, they retain their jurisdic jurisdiction over these projects, these properties, I should say, because they have to make sure they're maintained going forward. So you need to, you need to get their approval to, to go in and do a project, and that adds a, another layer. We do find, however, that both DEC and EPA are very um, accommodating, uh, as, as accommodating as they can be, to, uh, to solar projects on, on landfills and brownfields. If there's an owner who's responsible for maintaining this brownfield or landfill, and, and whether it's a cap or a groundwater system, you need them to be part of the process as well because they're going to say, hey, wait a minute, whether we own this property or not, we have an obligation to the state or federal government to keep this, this landfill or this brownfield under control, and you can't come in here and start putting holes every five feet in our liner. So you need their engagement and their sign-off and one of the other issues that we sometimes see with brownfields and landfills, I mentioned the concept of the good neighbor, uh, you know, whether it's fellow, uh, fellow industrial or commercial activities around it. We've been getting more and more uh, issues, and Dennis uh, knows about this as well from the, the Climate Leadership Council on the uh, uh, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. There's a big focus now on environmental justice and whether there are communities that are uh, bearing an undue burden for what has happened in the past. So, you know, you have low-income people living around old factories. Somehow they should, um, they, they should receive some benefit or they, they, there should be activities that further enhance the quality of their life. And we're seeing some of that here in the sense that uh, people are saying, well, you, you're only putting these uh, solar projects where the land is cheap and land is cheap here and that's where some lower income and other disadvantaged people live and they're now they're the ones that have to bear the burden of living next to the solar farms and the wind farms not the people that have lots of money and don't have to live here so environmental justice is starting to float around all of this and again because it comes up in the environmental context with the closure closed landfills and brownfields my guess is it's going to come up in this context as well. So with that, I'd like to um, uh, thank all of our panelists here this morning, uh, Greg for his great idea and little else, but uh, <laughs> uh, we, we've enjoyed talking to you uh, about solar projects and uh, uh, energy projects in New York and the Climate Leadership uh, Community Protection Act. Um, I think the, one of the common themes is uh, encouraging engagement in the, in the process. It's, it's going to be an intense three to five years where a lot is going to happen uh, on a, in a broad range of fronts to uh, initiate the actions that are going to be needed to move forward. Um, I, I've got a, I got one criticism with Dennis. He put up that these, these are goals whether it's uh, megawatts or gigawatts and tons of carbon and percents of carbon, they're goals, but they're in the statute. They're the law. This is not just some uh, guidance that somebody can say, well, we tried, but we didn't hit it. Um, it's, it's in the statute, and for that statute to change means the governor, the Senate, and the Assembly have to agree. And um, the chances, in my humble opinion,
of somebody, uh, all three of those entities agreeing to roll back substantially any of these uh, requirements is, is relatively small. So th this is there, it's the law. You, whether you like it or not, it's, it's there now. And as, as we like to say, now is the, the time for, you know, saying no, never is now changed to how do we steer the ship? How do we, or how do we input into the process to try and make this the system work? In, uh, and be respective, reflective of the interests of all.